grace and peace of God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the disciples and Jesus were walking in Jerusalem, going to the temple. And as they saw, the disciples saw this man, who I'm sure they had seen before. He was blind. They could not see. He had been blind from birth. This they knew. And so it put before them a question about life. Life as we know it is not always fair, at least in a human point of view. And life as we know it puts different types of questions before us and and different situations. And in fact, if we don't want life to hurt, then we can kind of cancel life by saying, You know, there's nothing really that important. Uh, Do it through philosophy or do it through drugs where we get or people get totally totally blocked off from reality. Or by philosophical, by Buddhism and Stoicism, other types of philosophy, we simply don't have any pleasures. If you don't have any pleasures, then you never will ever regret something that didn't happen. Similarly, we may always be on the guard. Always be on the guard. We don't want to get our hopes too high because if we get our hopes high, then we're going to be disappointed. Now, hopes have to be realistic, but Jesus had a different story. Jesus had a story in which this life right now, here on earth, would be abundant life for us. And you know, it's not an easy task at times to see and to understand that what is happening to me or what is happening to somebody we love or is just happening to somebody we just find out about, that that is part of God's plan. Because things do happen that are very difficult and tough. And the disciples asked one of the questions. The, the, the question that they asked was about this. Did this man sin? Is this why he was punished? Or did his parents sin? Because, see, he was blind from birth. And so they couldn't really blame him because he was blind as he was born. So there probably had to be the parents. And you see, they were following somewhat of a philosophy or somewhat of an understanding that we still do today. But certainly at that time, if you had something bad happen, it was because you deserved it. Or you had something bad happen, it was because you, of a sin that you did. Certainly poor judgment, walking away from God's law, walking into situations which we know from afar are not good, certainly can wind up to be bad, bad decisions and bad situations. But yet, there are things that happen in this world, and this is what Jesus told his disciples. There are things that happen in this world which are for God's glory. So he said, neither the parents, neither the person sinned, that's not what caused it, but rather it is to show you how powerful and wonderful God is and the love of God is for you. Then he became very personal. He spit, or as King James says, I think, he spat on the ground. And he bent over and he made a little little salve or a little put something he put on this person's eyes through the saliva of his of his own plus the mud he made a mud pack put it on the eyes of this poor person who had, was blind from birth and then said go to Salome to the pool of Salome and and wash it and which he did now apparently that's quite a distance it took some faith for this person however he got there perhaps he was led we don't know But he did go to the pool. He washed his eyes. He washed the spit and the mud off of his eyes. The spit of an incarnate God. And he could see. And he could see in a way that he had never seen before. And he comes back and he's rejoicing. And the Pharisees don't know what to do with this because this man called Jesus had performed a miracle. And this man, Jesus, had performed this miracle on the Sabbath day, which made it wrong. And he also was saying he was God. And that because of the power that he had in his, in his being, true God and true man, he could create or could cause this miracle. This answer to the question of the disciples and this answer of ours, why is this happening? 
And truly, it, it is correct that at times we'll never know, perhaps. But what we do know, and that's what the narrative now takes us and goes to where Jesus tells the parable of the Good Shepherd. And in the Good Shepherd, and in the story of the parable of the Good Shepherd, then he explains what he is about as far as him coming to this earth, to walk on this earth, to be with his disciples, to show the disciples the truth, to show this man who was blind from birth what, what it means and what it is to see, to be out of darkness, so that we also know what it's like to not be in darkness and to be able to see. The text that we use, we have already heard of it, or heard it in our children's message. It comes, as I said, in the middle of the parable, and it goes this way. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When we go back to the narrative of the blind man, who no longer was blind, who comes back, who declares that he can now see, and then people say, is this really the same man? Is this really the same man that was sitting by the side of the, of the temple and could not see. And some people said, no, it can't possibly be. And others said, oh, yes, it is. And then the Pharisees came because this was different than what their concept of life was about. Because they felt that if you kept the laws perfectly, then you would receive paradise, but you would also receive a good life. And now Jesus came in with a new story, a new covenant, which was really an old covenant, of saying that I am the Father's Son and also the Son of God. And so he was able to open the eyes of this man and also open our eyes as far as what life is about. So when we look at life and we think about what are the probabilities that everything will go smoothly in our life, we've got to define what smoothly is, don't we? Everything will go without any pain. No. Everything will go without loss. No. You see, because what we have, the life that we have, the goodness that we have, the love that we have, the relationships that we have, they're all cause, cause us to cherish what we have, and that is the abundant life. But in cherishing what we have, we also have the power and the strength and encouragement to have the confidence that we are on God's side, or maybe better put, God is on our side. The confidence that gives us hope and gives us peace and gives us joy. And we use the word joy instead of happiness because although God wants us to be happy, there certainly are times when we will have difficulty being happy, but yet we still can have joy. This man who was blind but now could see, came and testified to those that were around him what had happened. He said, this happened because of the prophet. And the Pharisees, as anybody that doesn't believe in our triune God, now tells us, any secularist or anybody who doesn't, he's saying, he doesn't exist. And what the Pharisees said is that he, this man that heals you cannot be from God because we obey Moses and the law. But you see, the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he brings to us not only the law, which he does, but also brings to us the grace. The grace in which he can then take that spit and put it with dirt and make some type of uh, mixture which sticks on this man's eyes. And that is similar. It's a stretch, but it is similar. What God does to our hearts makes them clean. It's not something that we can brag about because of what we have done, but it is something that we can assure, that we for sure can have peace with and strength and comfort. At the end of this narrative, finally, the Pharisees go to the parents and try to get the parents into trouble, and then uh, the parents said, well, he's a grown man. Go talk to him who did this. And he, they do, and he simply says, this is what happened. They ask him again, tell us the story again. What really happened? He says, I told you once. What is it? Do you want to, become, uh, do you want to also become his followers? 
And they got mad at him and threw him out of the temple. Now, interestingly, because he no longer could worship in the temple, at least one of the concerns for him was that he no longer could worship his God. Now, we know that, and he perhaps also knew, that he could worship God no matter if he could go in the temple or not. But that was the rule at that time, that if you could not go into the temple, you were separated from God. So what does Jesus do? So if we are ever separated in any which way, and that happens because of difficulties and frustrations and learnings, we learn by sometimes our faults. We learn sometimes by our fears. But we learn. And so as we learn, then, he, he, Jesus goes to this man who now could see and ask him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And this is our question. And you've answered it often. But I'll ask it one more time. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the now seeing man said, Tell me who he is. And you are listening to him. You are hearing him. And through the word you are hearing him. And he said, Your sins are forgiven. You can see And so from this particular narrative, then Jesus goes to tell parables which explain more about what his love is like. And so he uses the analogies, the parables of the shepherd. And if we think about the shepherd, we think about Psalm 23. uh, The Lord is my shepherd. And the Old Testament has many times where it talks about the shepherd being God and God taking care of us and taking care of the people. And one of the most powerful ones, besides Psalm 23, is given in, let's turn to it, Ezekiel, and it reads this way. Now, Ezekiel is writing these words, but here he says, and and notice this, the difference between Jesus and what he said is, Jesus would say, you know, storm, stop. But Ezekiel says, for thus says the Lord. He's speaking for the Lord. But now, here it is. The Lord says, well, he really said this in many words, but he said, I'm disgusted with the prophets that are serving your, my people. Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. And so now, we have this parable. The parable of the shepherd, Jesus being the good shepherd. Jesus explaining that he is the door. Jesus explaining that there is a a place, a a pen. Perhaps it's with stone walls. It's a safe circle. And in that circle is where sheep can rest and not be attacked and not to be killed and not be taken away. And inside that, that particular protective area, is where the sheep are. And Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, but also calls himself the door. And he lies in front of that door in this metaphor, and no one can come in and can hurt his sheep and hurt us. Now the Pharisees were well aware of the Old Testament. The disciples were well aware of the Old Testament. They knew about the shepherd. They knew that that God himself, through Ezekiel, had said, I will be the shepherd of these people. And now Jesus is taking these words, this analogy, and is telling the people so plain and so truthfully. And he's also saying, these sheep know my voice, and we know his voice. Now, the disciples were there. They were listening They heard this. They not only heard this analogy, this metaphor, but they saw what Jesus did. They saw that he brought in people to himself and and he performed miracles and he performed uh, and and he did these signs as John talked about them. And the disciples were listening. Some of which is written, John has written it, Matthew has written it. Mark has written it, about, although not a disciple at that time. But then there's a disciple that I want you to hear from right now. This truth, the truth that Jesus spoke to us, It is in the middle of his 
story about being a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And so that tomb which encompassed him, which was around him, and then the door was rolled away, and the gate was open. And likewise, we are surrounded by the love of God like a corral with strong walls around us. And our Lord is there at the gate. And so when we go out and we live our life that He wants us to live in an abundant way, when we expose ourselves to situations in which if we are confident and if we are hopeful and we have peace in our hearts, not only will we be at times disappointed, and that's my issue, at times we will be faced with feelings maybe like James the Lesser had that God didn't quite know who he was. But even at that time, and particularly because of that time, Life eternal is there and the assurance and the knowledge of life eternal and assurance and knowledge of Jesus being our shepherd guides us through those dark times, through those bright times, through those times of life. What do we do? What is it that we can do to strengthen us and and keep us strong? Peter says this, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge. And so the law that was given, the law that the Pharisees thought was so exactingly clear and what they, what they needed to do in order to have salvation, they, they expanded the law. They took away things that were important and made things that were not important important. But the law as we know it, the law that comes from God, the, the commandments, the, great, the, 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 the uh, greatest law of all laws, loving our neighbor as ourselves, loving God above all things, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. That is our guideline and our lead. It moves us through to this position that we will have confidence in life, that in that confidence we know where we're going, and in that confidence we know how to live each and every day with peace and hope and courage. And in God's name, We say together, Amen.